Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel, Sharspirationals, where I am uh, sharing God's word with people and helping them to understand God's word, um, the meaning of God's word, whichever one he sends me to, I post it up a week later. Um, usually these videos are posted up a week after I record, like for instance, I'm recording today, December 26th, the day, the day after Christmas. God has been telling me since I posted um, last week about baptism uh, that he wanted me to go next into the Ten Commandments. And now today is the start of it. Uh, this is going to be rather lengthy because he wants me to go into extensive about the Ten Commandments and what happened right after the Ten Commandments was told to the Israelites and how they reacted and what they did. Um, because, because this is, because that is an example of the consequences of the dire consequences you face whenever you break the commandments. And also it, it's going to tie back into baptism of why God sacrificed Jesus Christ for us and why we revere God and Jesus so much. So this it's going to be why we love God, why we love Jesus, uh, why we hold them at such high level because it's God and Jesus. They're amazing and they love us and they sacrifice so much for us because of their love. All right. All right. So now we are going to get into the Ten Commandments. This is starting with Exodus 19, 1 through 6. Um. I wanted to start off with this part because it's it's setting everything up uh, for the Ten Commandments and everything. So um, I'm going to read it and then I'll t tell you what's going on if you are um, having a hard time um, keeping up. Okay, so we're on Exodus 19, 1 through 6. It says, uh, this is the NIV version. It says, in the third month after the Israelites left Egypt on the very day they came to the, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camp, camped there in a the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although, although the earth, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Okay, so God tells Moses this. Right before he gives the Ten Commandments or the day before. He also gives Moses some instructions of what to do with the people of Israel so they can hear the commandments themselves. Um, they had to consecrate themselves and abstain from sexual relations. Uh, this preparation took about three days. And uh, on the third day, God came at the top of Mount Sinai. And only Moses could go up there. Only Moses was ordained by God to be a direct contact for the people because this is before Jesus. So because this is before Jesus, the people had to go through a priest chosen by God that God found worthy enough to speak directly to him, to send out his word to people, to help people to get closer to him but also to inform them of sin and also uh, consecrate and purify and sanctify them uh, from sin and Moses was one of the priests and 
Moses went up the mountain to speak with God and God gave him the Ten Commandments. And we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments right now. So the only two people that were able to go up is Moses and Aaron. Aaron was another priest um, that God, I don't want to say how they revered, but it was Moses and Aaron. They were the two priests that were ordained by God to be in his presence. Moses was a direct mouthpiece, but Aaron was also there to help Moses. And this is what God told them on Mount Sinai. And this is also with the people down the mountain. Um, they had to be consecrated and sanctified to be able to hear and listen to God and his commandments as Moses told him. Okay. Uh, the Ten Commandments, this is Exodus 21 through 17. It's pretty extensive because... God goes into detail, okay? It says, And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, which is obvious. God is our only God. He is the only God. There are no other gods. We should not have any other God other than him just God all right the second commandment you shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God punishing the children of the sin for the Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, so this is straightforward. God saying, you're not to have any other gods. You're not to make any idols. Um, we all know about the golden calf, which is what I'm going to talk about after I talk about this um about the ten commandments that that's the consequence of not following the ten commandments oh, the God, Lord Jesus. so the first one you shall you shall have no other gods before me so no other gods Commandment number two, you shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Um, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. So we sh should not have any idols, whether um, it is a celebrity, whether it is another God, whether it is... Um, a piece, a mantle, a, a mantelpiece. Um, we those we can't. We are not supposed to worship them. We're not supposed to pray to them because we only have one God, and that's our Father God, Lord, our Father God and Lord Jesus, who are up in heaven. We do not need an idol to worship them. We don't need a golden calf. We don't need a mantle because objects are just objects they don't mean anything they don't have power the i don't want to say person because it's god the only one who has power is god okay these objects that people worship in place of god is not it doesn't have power and god is a jealous god and like he said here for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You see what he has done and what he does to the people who don't follow him and who hate him, um, like the enemy and those of the enemy and demons. And you see what he does to those people. It's in the Bible what he does to those people. If he does those to, that to those people and curse their generations to the third and fourth generation, what do you think he's going to do to you? You're supposed to be his child. He loves you dearly. 
Like, what do you expect him to do whenever you worship celebrities more than him? Um, when you worship public figures more than him, when you worship a uh, golden calf or a, a symbol more than him, he he gets furious. He's a jealous God. He's the only God. He loves us dearly. He only wants us to love him. And I don't think that's a lot to ask for because he's the only true God it is God. Okay, now to the third one. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Another way to say this, don't use the Lord's name in vain. Don't use the Lord's name in vain, uh, which, also, which also goes into when people say, the Lord told me to do this in God's name and they're doing evil acts that's not what god is about or when people use his god name to try to influence you to do something that's what some of my family members always did they always brought up god and how um you shouldn't be doing that because god looked down upon it and when i'm talking about that it's they try to manipulate that in me to take care of my father and my earthly father who has not done anything for me my whole life and um and they always use that to guilt trip me into um either spending time with them or doing what they wanted me to do instead of what I wanted to do or what God wanted me to do I would just think that well you know God is this way, so obviously that makes sense for me to do this, but that's not how God works. God will let you know what's for you and what he wants you to do. True, he do go through other people or bring other people to you to tell you what to do, but that's the reason why you have to go to God in prayer for discernment to know who's for you and who is against you. And who is plotting and manipulating you. God will give you that wisdom and understanding and that discernment. Um, yeah. So don't use the Lord's name in vain. Don't be. Don't go like, oh, I'm doing this because God told me so just to say that. No. Only say that when God did indeed tell you to do that. Okay. Because... God has a reputation and he doesn't like it when people muddy his reputation and lie about him because we all know who God is or the people who are with God, who've been with God for a while know who God is. He's a God that doesn't forsake us. He's a God that doesn't lie and he does not like evil acts so if someone's using god's name to get you to do something that you don't want to do or to get you to do something heinous or to manip manipulate you in any way that's not god god wouldn't do that okay now to number four remember the t Ooh. remember the sabbath day by keeping it holy Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor or daughter, nor your manservant or maid servant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, so we've all heard this before, like since we were kids about the Ten Commandments, what they are. But we never really went into detail about what they mean. The one of them is remember the sab Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So the Sabbath day is the seventh day. Um, when you go to the book of Genesis and God talks about the creation of the heaven and the earth 
and how he worked for six days and the seventh day he rested. So because God rested on the seventh day, we are also granted rest on the seventh day as a commemoration of God. We use the seventh day. <clears throat> we use the seventh day to spend time with God. That's why it says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The way you keep it holy is by worshiping God, spending time with God, praising God. That's why on Sundays, people go to church. Now, there is some discourse where people, some people are like the Sabbath day is really Saturday, which is why some, some churches do have church on Saturday instead of Sunday. So, um, as long as, I believe as long as you're spending one of those days with God, it's fine. But if you would like to sit down and speak to God about it, you can. Because the way society is, it's hard to take Saturday off, depending on your job, uh, to praise God. And most of the services, church services nowadays are Sundays and not Saturdays. So that, that'll be quite difficult. Um, but maybe you can find a church that has a Saturday service. But I feel as long as you are able to celebrate God, go to church, and spend time with God on Saturday or Sunday, then you're keeping it holy. So remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. There is, growing up, I thought it was... Remember the Sab Sabbath day and keep it holy, but it is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So that makes a difference because it gives an understanding that not only are we not supposed to work, no one is supposed to work on the Sabbath day, but you're supposed to keep it holy by spending time with God. That's how you keep it holy. All right, let's go to number five. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Okay, so this one is a hard one for me because, and I know there's, it's a hard one for other people because in today's society, mothers and fathers are not some mothers and fathers are not mothers and fathers. They are mothers and fathers by like DNA and blood, but they they don't have the title, you know, of uh, the the personality or the persona of a father or a mother. So you have absentee fathers and absentee mothers, but then you do have some that come back and try to um, remedy the situation and actually be there for their children. But um, what I wanted to say is, for those of you who are like me, who had an absentee father and whose father has caused them strife throughout your whole life, um, we do need to forgive, if even if it's not your father, but your mother. Um, we do need to forgive them because that forgiveness is not for them, it's for us. Because God judged us by what we do. And if we don't forgive them, then God won't forgive us for not forgiving them. So we have to spend time with God and go through the tough situation of speaking to God or going to therapy about what, what that absentee father or mother or what that abusive mother or father or what that horrible mother or father did to us when we were younger and we have to work through that so we can get into a better place not just for ourselves but also for our spirit and to get in a better place with God so those of you who went through a tough childhood with your parents because of your parents or one of your parents or or your it doesn't have to be your mother or father maybe your mother or father dad and your aunt or uncle or grandmother grandpa whoever it is watched over you and because they were deemed your guardian they are in essence your mother and father and they mistreated you too that also goes to you 
you will have to spend time with God, go to therapy to help you work through that so you can forgive them. So you can seek redemption. So you can seek forgiveness from God, from harvesting that anger, that resentment, that hurt. Because God don't want you to feel that pain. That pain is horrible. I held that pain for so long of my life. And I recently just, during my fasting in October, November, was able to say I actually forgive my dad for what he did. Yes, um, it's sad. And it is what Jesus has said in the Bible before. I can't, I don't know where, but he told God to forgive them for they do not know what they do. Because it's not the people that are like that. It's their demons. Um, And I know a lot of people use demons as a figurative thing, but demons are real. And they um occupy people and they cause people to act in ways that you would never think of. Um, Like one minute, one minute they'll be like a doting father, a doting mother. And then the next minute they abusing you or they abandon you. Those are demons and that's what they do. They cause chaos and issue. Those are demons. Okay. So, and also a demon is, um, alcoholism, drugs, um, prostitution prostitution um like sexual addiction things like that are demons that are inhabiting people's bodies and causing them to do all these things which is why jesus is like it's not, um, to god forgive them for they do not know what they do because they don't know what they're doing i mean of course they're doing it and they have the recollection of doing it but they don't know how deep it goes. It goes to a spiritual level and they don't understand that. So that's why you should seek to forgive them because it's not them. It's the demons that they're plagued with. And in order to help them to get on the road to redemption, you also need to give your forgiveness to help them to to get past any hurdles that they're trying to get through. Like with my dad, one of his holdups with me was that I won't forgive him for what he did. But I told him I forgave him. So I'm praying that helps him to get better with actually trying to get better with his mental illness and getting better with how he treats people. All I can do is just pray for him now because only by the mighty hand and power of and by the mighty hand of God, that man will be rectified and purified and helped because he's been plagued with so many, so many issues and demons over the years. And only God can fix that. And for those of you who have great parents um, that don't have issue with parents, but you might have, because you can have like a great and amazing mom father guardian but there might have been some misunderstandings or issues that happened with with you growing up that you're still trying to work out but you still have a relationship with them just sit down talk to god go to therapy even talk to them about it so you can get through it so you can forgive them um because we should honor our father and our mother because they're the head of the household, okay? They're our mother and our father. And this doesn't mean like um, doing what an abusive father says or an abusive mother says or an alcoholic mother or an alcoholic father. No, there are um, restrictions to this. Only do what is right in the sense of God. Okay, so if they are telling you to do something sinful or evil, don't do it. Go to God about it, okay? He will guide you through that situation and help you. But for the ones that have a great relationship, 
Um, congratulations. Some of us sadly don't, but um, I am always happy and ecstatic for the people who actually got to live with a, a great father. And a, I have a great mother, but sadly I didn't have too much of a good father. But um, for those of you who had that father figure, um, that great father figure, congratulations. For those of you who had a great mother figure like I did, <laughs> congratulations to us because we got great moms. But um, honor your father and your mother. Now, the only person you listen to higher than them is God. Unless you're married, then is when you're married, it changes. For women, is God your husband, then you. For men, it's God directly because the way everything is set up is God. Well, actually, I keep God forgive me. So, is God Jesus Christ your husband, then you, then your kids? Okay. Once you're married, it's you and your husband and God and Jesus. It's no your family. It's just, that's your new family, okay? God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, um, your husband and you. That's your new family. So any issues that you have, um, I don't have advice for married relationships, but because I'm not, I'm not married myself, but God has been showing me some things to to prepare me for marriage and whenever you have an issue go to God first and then he will direct you on what you need to do and where you should go from there um I'm getting ahead of myself we, we're talking about the ten commandments and we're on and we're on number five where it says under your father and your mother so whenever you're not married um, your parents are above you, um, uh, before that connection with Jesus and God. Okay. So that's the reason why you should honor them because they're your father. They're your mother. They deserve your respect because they've done so much for you. The ones that actually been there and did stuff. Okay. Now the ones that are abusive and all that stuff. <sighs> You'll have to work with God to forgive them uh, and talk to God about how you should handle that situation because every situation is unique. All right. Another reason why you should honor your mother and your father is because they have made sacrifices for you throughout their lives. Like they chose to do either the job that they work or they chose not to do a vacation or they chose not to do something to make sure you get the best care possible the best education possible that they're able to give you the best care possible that they're able to give you those are the reasons why we should honor our parents our guardians the ones that actually you know take care of us the ones that actually put in the time and the work because they do so much for us I always remember that and keep that to heart so if you do have like an issue of falling out with a parent or a, a, or a guardian that actually took care of you, um, spend time with God to help help you to forgive them and also speak with them and tell them the issue that you have with them so you can be on good terms with your parent or guardian. Yeah. Now to number six. Okay. You shall not murder. I mean, that's straightforward. Don't kill people. Killing people is horrible. Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. He was stained with the blood of Abel on his hands because he was jealous. And we saw what happened to Cain. Uh, he was cursed. So, don't kill. It's not our right to kill people. It's not our right to judge people it's not our right to kill people or prosecute people it's, it's it's not for us to do it's for god to do to see fit for it 
All right, number seven. Do not commit adultery. Okay. So God had me look up adultery for those of you, you know, you're not really quite sure what adultery is. Okay. This is the dictionary definition. Adultery. Voluntary sexual intercourse. Sex. Between a married person and a person who is not their spouse. In today's world where the side chick or... Um, I can't say the other one because I just, well, the side chick or the side man or the side N word, what they say is like the it thing. Um, it's a sin. When you're married, your commitment is to your husband or your wife, or if you're a man, if you're a man, your wife. If you're a woman, your husband. That is the person you went into a covenant with, with God. Okay. The marriage is such, oh my goodness, God. Oh, I'm about to cry because marriage is such a holy union. It's, uh, it's such a holy union that God honors dearly. And means so much to him. And for people to be freely, willy nilly and going to sleep with whoever they want to while they're married, just stay single. Okay? Oh, God. That reminds me of whenever Paul was telling them, I gotta go and find him. It's as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry, but because there is so much immortality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman for, and each woman her own husband. The husband shall fulfill the marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. And the way the husband's body does not belong to him, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not a, as a command. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. So now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am, but if they cannot control themselves they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion so the only time you are to have sex okay sexual intercourse is when you married okay you're not supposed to have sex outside of marriage um you're only supposed to be with that person you married the the person you entered into a married relationship with it's not meant for you to enter the married relationship and go off and violate it by sleeping with someone else that's a sin because you're breaking that covenant with god that's a sacred covenant marriage is what's so frustrating in society nowadays is that it downplays marriage so much it just it's just become a means of just marrying who you can for status or marrying who you can for wealth or marrying who you can just so you can have, you know, um, just to get married. That's not what marriage is. Marriage is about you coming into agreement with somebody to not just live your life together, but also come together in Christ to show the glory of God. That is what marriage truly is. 
Um, it's not just for you to, oh, it's not just for you to be like, oh, I'm married, so I can go have sex. No, that's not what it's about. It's not the permission slip that God signs to give you full access to having sex whenever you like. Yes, it does say here in the Bible that the wife's body, the wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also her husband. But it also say in the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also his wife. So whenever you get married, you belong to each other. It's that's why they say it's a three strand cord. It's God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, all three of them together because they're all the same part of the same entity, which is God, but they're three separate ones. Um, combined with you and your husband or you and your wife. Um it's a three strand cord to it's a three strand cord. Okay, it's a sacred bond. It is a sacred covenant with the Lord because God is bringing two people together under him so they can bring him glory. That is what marriage is. It's not just for procreation or just having sex. It's more than that. And that intricate part of marriage has gone missing. And that is what God is working to bring back. With um, that's why you hear about God ordained marriages, God ordained spouses, God ordained wives, God ordained husbands, or kingdom wives, kingdom marriages, kingdom husbands, because God is trying to restore the sanctity of marriage that has been stripped away over each generation. Marriage is sacred and it's beautiful, and for the people who enter to enter a marriage just so nonchalantly and to just do it for money or do it for status or do it just to have sex is wrong. That's wrong. That's not what marriage is supposed to be. And for your people to commit adultery against their wife or against their husband is horrible you're violating that promise that covenant you made not only to your wife or your husband but to God you you're breaking that contract that you made can go down and so, so we don't have to